Gary Gibb, he's a proper legend. A songwriting genius. Well, I'm always reflecting on my life. It's been a fantastic adventure. Barry Gibb, with his brothers, wrote some huge selling records for everyone from Barbara Streisand to you name it. I wear everything on my sleeve. I try to be as open as I can be. Barry is now the only one of his brothers who's still alive. And I think it's had a hugely profound effect. Tonight, he's going to talk about this for the first time, really. The spotlight goes from the three of us to me, and that's that's daunting. Well, Barry Gibbs bringing his guitar, apparently. I'm assuming it's to play backing to my full setter. Piers, I'm looking forward to this. I'll see you in there. We've had some ovations before for people, but few quite with the warmth that you just received there. It's wonderful, but you know, there's, there's so many familiar faces here that I think it's a setup. <laughs> <laughs> I see so many people that, I, that I've known for many, many years. So, you know. The stats are incredible, Barry, in your career. One of your songs is played on the radio somewhere in the world every 20 seconds. God. Um, well, first of all, <laughs> that's, that's, that's staggering. I've been a fan all my life of so many different artists, so it's, it's very difficult for me to, to visualise myself. Never been able to do that. I love it because I love the songs. You've been topping the charts for over half a century. Writing all yeah. those songs has made you, obviously, staggeringly rich. Do you know how much you're worth? No. No. I, I know how much I owe. <laughs> <laughs> um... But money isn't the first thing in life for me. It just, it really isn't. I think having fun is more important than anything else. My firm belief is that the Bee Gees copyrights are worth than something I can't even imagine. Like what? So, I, I can't do that. If I try to buy them off you tomorrow? I'd say to you what I've said to everybody else. It's not for sale. It's not for sale. One of the unique things about you, Barry, was, of course, the falsetto voice. Yes. And uh, I'm yeah. not going to make you do too much of this. It's cause... all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfectly all right. <laughs> Got it. When was the first moment you realised you had that ability to sing falsetto? Uh, it was a song called Nights on Broadway, and Arif Marden was working with us in the studio at that point in time. He was a producer, right? Yes. Yeah. And he said, uh, so you got, someone's got to go out and scream. Mm. I thought, well, I'll volunteer, I'll go out and try it. It was like, you know, play me now! It just came like that and just kept working it and everyone kept saying doing more of it. I, you know, if I, I do that every day anyway for a joke to myself in the bedroom. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You wake up and you think, it's just yep, me and I you, go, Barry. Bap, bap, bap. <laughs> as long as I hear that, I know everything's fine. <laughs> I'm not sure everything's fine for everyone else. How, but... <laughs> how high can you go? I don't really know. Hang on. It's really a G. <laughs> or maybe it's an A. <laughs> yeah, I can stretch it. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. It's not. <laughs> Could you train uh, anybody else to sing falsetto? Could you tell yeah, me how to do uh, yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> What's the top of your range? No I have way. absolutely no idea. <laughs> yeah. But you're about to hear it. So yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Try to read! Is there anything I can do to improve? Yeah. What? Don't do it. It's pretty scary. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty scary. You have a mercurial genius for songwriting. Where does that ability come from? I mean, are you aware of it? Do you have to work at it? Uh, I wouldn't call it work, because it's something you love doing. I love love songs. I love all, all kinds of romantic songs. But I don't find it to be something that you work at. It, it, it comes to you, and my saying is, let it ferment. And so I'll wait a week or two, and it'll, it'll write itself. It'll come by on its own. You wrote three number one singles in one afternoon. It was 1979, it was Tragedy, mm. 
Too Much Heaven mm. and Shadow Dancing, which was younger brother Andy's US yes, number one. Yes, she's also a writer yeah. How could you write three such massive hits? Um, just a there's few a couple albums. of answers to that. Um, one is drugs, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. <laughs> um, You're all on amphetamines, weren't you? Is that right? Yes, yes. You could take a pill and get high for eight hours, ten hours. Tell me about what happened that day. Uh, we were in... <laughs> we were sitting in the lounge. Hang on. <laughs> so... It's just the way you feel at that moment. That became it. We thought, OK, how do we, how do we grow that? First of all, it's the chorus, you know? You know that that's the centre. What's the song about? OK? And that See, becomes... I feel like I'm almost in the room with you now. I mean, it's such a <laughs> weird... I mean, without the speed, obviously. But... <laughs> well... <laughs> <laughs> Let's do a ballad. Let's write a ballad. Mm, yeah. You know, yeah. Nobody gets too much love anymore. It's as high as a mountain. Oh, where, where did that... That's amazing, right? <laughs> well, you both have... <laughs> yeah, um... Barry, as soon as you picked up a guitar, you were destined to become one of the world's biggest stars. Barry Gibb, the pop virtuoso who's been filling my dance floors and tugging our heartstrings for more than five decades. How deep is your love? Is your love He's one of the masters of the most fantastic pop song catalogue in history. It's only worth These melodies are exquisite. He just has a very beautiful way of saying things that really touch you. As the Bee Gees with brothers Robin and Morris, Barry has sold more than 200 million records. Oh. Barry is a great singer, but above all, he's a songwriter. Barry and his brothers have composed smash hits for a roll call of the world's biggest stars. Barry is a hit maker, and everybody wanted a hit. Including me. Barry began writing songs aged only eight, and when the family moved to Australia three years later, he and his brothers began performing in pubs and clubs. They were playing in places that had things like dancing girls, and they were backstage, and women were taking their clothes off, and, and you know, there are three young kids. I don't think they had much time for school. Barry's talent soon caught the eye of TV producers. Is it true that you write your own pieces, Barry? It's true, doesn't it? And uh, what are you going to play for us now you've come down from Brisbane? Uh, time is passing by. My dad, it just cracks me up. He, you know, he looked like a greaser. <laughs> Robin and Morris were just, you know, two adorable kids that had these beautiful voices. <laughs> Barry, even at 13, he, he did have a presence then, you could see. Now called the Bee Gees, the boys began to release Barry's songs as singles. Once, oh yeah, so they recorded four songs. I said, gee, it's a shame we haven't got half a dozen, Barry. And he said, wait a minute, and I'll write a couple. <laughs> and that's the kind of incredible talent he has. In search of wider fame and now writing together, the brothers returned to England. And within six months, they were number one. And the lies group racked up hit after hit. I mean, we could be watching TV. He said, I've got an idea. You could do that in the middle of the night. Take his guitar and write a song about it. It's like he just pulls them from the air. In the mid-70s, the Bee Gees songwriting was about to hit new heights. What the Bee Gees did was marry their gift for melody with the disco beat. And when they were asked to record the soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever, the Bee Gees were launched into the stratosphere. The first time I heard Saturday Night Fever, I was green with envy. <laughs> song after song after song, it was so incredible. 
became the biggest selling soundtrack in history. And it changed the face of music. Saturday Night Fever is as fresh today as it was then. That falsetto style of singing, it's amazing. Barry Gibbs' voice is the sound of a whole generation. By the late 70s, they were the biggest pop group in the world. We had a private jet, huge stadiums. The audiences were just going wild. I think Dad loved it. I think he loved every moment. It was just a wonderful time. Magical. Saturday Night Fever. I mean, it was such a phenomenon. What was the impact on you personally, your families? For me, the things that changed was don't answer the phone. The things that changed was people climbing over your walls. Mm. And, and the FBI coming to your door and telling you that somebody wants to shoot you, you know? Really? Not everyone loved disco. <laughs> <laughs> All of the upsides of it, I loved. I enjoyed it. Everyone enjoys getting attention. What is the best thing about stratospheric fame? Getting, um, 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 wanting something and getting it. You know, whatever said, you want. Whatever you want. What was the most you absurd know? purchase you ever made? It was a Lamborghini. <laughs> and it went back in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Wrong colour? No, <laughs> beautiful colour. <laughs> but I discovered that I, I, it was wonderful to get into, but I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> Well, they are tricky doors, aren't they? Very, and, and, and I saw, I spotted myself in a shop window, trying to get out of it. <laughs> and I had to roll out of the car. <laughs> it's just silly. You developed an iconic look through that period, Barry Gibb. Oh, God. <laughs> now, there was an allegation, unproven, that you wore a chest wig. No. None of, none of us, specifically, <laughs> categorically, none of us ever wore chest, hair. None of us were aware of it. These Sorry. are your real chest mains? Well, well, Robin had quite a hairy chest. Yeah. I, I was badly scalded as a child, mm. so I don't have a hairy chest. I have a fantastic scar. Well, we've got another picture yeah. to show you. Yeah. Twins, Robin and Morris, younger brother Andy. And the hair is really going for it here. Yeah, it's gone for <laughs> it. Kind of, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the look you're going for there, Barry? Uh, windy. <laughs> Um, but the green pants, Robin used to wear these green jeans all the time and I often talked about it on stage and always bewildered me. And he, <laughs> he dyed his hair the colour of his dog and I think so there was different... <laughs> he had a red setter and he dyed his hair red. As we sit here, you're in a very unusual position of being the eldest of four brothers yeah. and yet you're the, the one who has survived and your three younger brothers have all died. What is that sensation for you like? Um, devastating. We were a group for 45 years. We were, we were glued to each other, you know? So if I thought something, they knew. And if they thought something, I knew. It happened with Andy when he was only 30. And that was a heartbreaker. I mean, that was destroying for the whole family because the whole family really hadn't witnessed losing anyone. Mm. Morris was the next one we lost and I never stopped thinking about their characters, you know. Robin's character was extremely uh, humorous. Uh, Morris was very open. And you put us all together and that's what made it work. It wasn't just about writing songs, it was about singing in harmony. You've said in an interview that you've had some strange kind of paranormal experiences since your brothers died. Yeah, yes, they are. Uh, well, I saw Robin in my house in Miami walk across from the front door to the bar. And I went to look, and there was nobody there. But, uh, but and maybe you know, maybe it's in your own head. But it was wrong. Did you yeah. find that um, a disturbing experience or a very nice experience? Nice experience. I, it, it wasn't scary. It was just oh, there's Rob. Would you like to elaborate on you, Linda, and what happened in Doctor Who's TARDIS? <laughs> You were born Barry Allen Crompton Gibb on the Isle of Man yes. on the 1st of September 1946. Your parents were Hugh and Barbara and you had an older sister, Leslie. You were 18 months old 
when you tipped a, a boiling pot of tea over yourself. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I, I remember pulling the boiling pot and I, I don't have any memory of it after that. According to my mum, she said I, I didn't speak for two years. So I, I, get, I think I was in hospital for a long, long time. You were in a coma, weren't you, for a while? Uh, yeah, but I, I, but I don't know about it. We were told you were 20 minutes from death. Well, they told me that. Mum told me that. And in yeah, terms of yeah. the physical scarring? Well, school was a little um, awkward. Going swimming, something was wrong with you. Mm. You know, you had this scar. Because it's quite extensive, isn't it? It is, my, my entire chest. And, and, and this arm, see? Wow. That's, yeah, it's extensive. extensive. Your younger twin brothers, Robin and Morris, were born in December 1949. Yep. What's your first memory of those two? Um, the, the, the three of us finding a baby in a stream, in a box. Really? Yep. And, and I remember us taking this baby, floated by, just floated by. Alive? Yes. And, a and baby floated absolutely. by you in a box? Yes. <laughs> Do you get a feeling random stuff happens to you, Barry? <laughs> well, we could have just left it float and by. We said yeah. that. <laughs> it was perfectly normal, would not it? Well, that's, that's my first active memory of my brothers and me, taking this baby out of the stream and... Saving his life. I suppose, but we never knew who the baby was. And we took the baby to a nearby house. They took the baby in. They told us to go home. Never heard another word about it. But oh, never forgot I've got it. a surprise for you. <laughs> you see it? <laughs> it was me. <laughs> Good to see you again. And on behalf of a grateful nation, thank you. <laughs> You've said in an interview that you and your brothers were... Right little tearaways. Well, it was ver verging on criminal. I mean, we would... <laughs> well, it was criminal, wasn't it? You just didn't get caught very often. I got two years probation. You did? Yeah. Um, for, for what? Uh, stealing stealing a, a mini car mm. out of a child's driveway. You had to set fire to things, the Gibb brothers. Um, we loved building little fires. You know? Setting fire to things? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would set little I'll fires, tell you, I'll tell and you then the... things would accidentally catch fire. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> we would... We built a little fire, we put bricks around it, yeah. behind a whole set of billboards. And then we, instead of putting it out, we'd just leave it, you know? We used to go to the baths and swim, and we'd go and get our towels and come down back down the street, and there's traffic everywhere, and there's smoke, and there's <laughs> the billboards roll over the street, and we'd oh, my God, that we didn't put the fire out, you know? <laughs> And there was a policeman standing on that corner right next to us, and we had our towels under our arms. And he looked at us and he went, yeah, he said, we'll catch him. <laughs> <laughs> your father was a drummer and a band yeah, leader. Uh, your mum was a singer. So music was obviously a big part of the Gibb family. Yeah. My dad was, had a 13-piece band during the war. And when we first started playing, I think when I was about nine years old, eight years old, the three of us started really singing together and harmonising. Dad would be the drummer. He would, we would get a chance to play somewhere and Dad would play the drums. Well, what kind of man was your dad? Oh, my God. Um, very dogmatic. Very dogmatic. I wouldn't say... He could be, he could be an angry man. He could be um, aggressive. He could be a very aggressive man. But at the end of it, by the time we got to our teens, he had the same dream he began to realise that, that his kids could actually make something of themselves. And then you emigrate as a family. You found fame in Australia. You, Barry, were a very good-looking, successful teenager with a great voice. You described yourself as a, as a rogue with the ladies. Would you like to elaborate? Uh, I don't know if I was a rogue. Did I say that? <laughs> well, your words, not mine. I, I, I always had to have a relationship, even when I was about 13 or 14, and believe me, I was dumped and rejected more times than, you, than anyone can imagine. At one stage, you had six girlfriends mm. when you were either 15 or 16. <laughs> and when I say six girlfriends, I mean <laughs> at the same time, Barry. Uh, well, uh... <laughs> and each of them had been led to believe that you wanted to marry them. <laughs> because your little trick was to carry a stash of rings in your pocket, ready for use whenever they were needed.
Let the jury, let the jury know no denial whatsoever. I had an A-ring. <laughs> what one you just kept using? Well, yeah. <laughs> you know. How many times in that period did you propose marriage? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Barry, in the late 60s, you and your brother shot to fame, and it wasn't just your songs which were driving the fans wild. Just the in 1967, the Bee Gees were storming the charts, and Barry was becoming an icon. Have you seen my wife, Mr. Jones? Well, at the end of the 60s, the Bee Gees were huge. Barry looked the perfect pop star, really. Not a hair out of place. You opened any of the magazines in those days, and he was always there. He was always incredibly well-dressed. Most guys were, were a little bit jealous, I think. And they had good reason to be jealous. Barry was an incredibly good-looking young man. Every female in the world fell in love with him. Barry Gibb was like Prince Valiant. He just stood there, and people screamed in excitement. <laughs> I think he loved it, you know, being the sexiest man alive. Morris and Robin loved it too, but yeah, maybe Dad milked it a little more. But Barry was keeping a secret from his swooning fans. He was already married. Aged 19, he'd wed his teenage sweetheart, Maureen, in Australia before moving to England. She was his first real love in Australia. He told me it just seemed like the thing to do because back then, People fell in love young, got married young. But Barry's passion for his career drove the couple apart. The music took over everything in his life, and he just didn't really have anything to give to a relationship at that time, and he was so young. He separated from Maureen. There was still, you know, so much for him in his mind that he needed to achieve. On September the 21st, 1967, the Bee Gees were on TV with their first number one single. In Massachusetts. That night, Barry's life would change in more ways than one. It was the Bee Gees' first performance on Top of the Pops. The girls I was with, they said, oh, my God, that guy is so handsome. Mom was Miss Edinburgh, and, and she was a good-looking girl. Their eyes met, you know. He's looking at you, and I said, no, he's not. And they said, oh, he's coming over. I think for Dad, yeah, he, he'll always say it was love at first sight. He asked me if I'd like to go for a cup of tea. Before the end of the day, I think they were making out in Doctor Who's phone booth. God, Barry was damn attractive. Barry and Linda became an item, but the course of true love didn't always run smoothly. God, he had women left, right and centre if he wanted. She'd messed around a couple of times, and I was not very happy about that. I still don't know why I was the one, but I'm glad I am. Even Barry's mum was aware of his reputation. When he told his mum and dad, oh, this is Linda, we're, we're going to get married. And I'm in the kitchen with her, and she said, don't be silly, love. She said, he says that to all the girls. VIP transport for very important pop star Barry Gibb. Despite his mum's scepticism, Barry did tie the knot with Linda. He's getting married to 20-year-old Linda Gray. Linda's a former Miss Edinburgh. They've now been together for nearly 50 years. He is the, you know, epitome of the doting husband. Still, they love each other today just, just like they did then. Yeah, they're, they're very romantic. I don't think anybody else would put up with them, actually. Or me. <laughs> Tonight. I could see you shaking. I could see you gesticulating. Clearly, the, the torrent of revelations there was taking you by surprise, Barry Gibb. It's amazing. Was it love at first sight? I think it was. I, I think in my own head, I thought, that's the woman I'm going to spend my life with. What was it about Linda that really enraptured well, she, you? She's a very, very special person. And it's not, it's not how one looks or, one, or, or you know, um, she's just so full of love and full of fun and she has a great sense of humour and we tend to laugh a lot more at everything around us than, than we could find anything to be unhappy about. Linda, she's sitting there yes. in the audience. <laughs> you, did, fact, you didn't know she was doing an interview for this programme. No, you, I did you not. You do now, obviously. No, I did not. <laughs> but look at my daughter. Okay, yeah? She's incredible. Uh -huh. They're both incredible. Yeah. Would you like to elaborate on 
you, Linda, and what happened in Doctor Who's TARDIS? <laughs> I kept you on that one, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a cuddle. And, a cuddle? And yes. Well, uh, given what you've told us about what went on in Australia, I find that very, very hard good, to good. believe. No, she was very good. Uh, and, and she wasn't going to have any nonsense from me. When did you propose? And how did you propose? Do you remember? I think I proposed at Eaton Square. No? <laughs> This is absolutely great. <laughs> um, will you tell us? Adam Trow, then you went to America with Robert Morris. Right. So I'll leave you two to no. the interview. <laughs> Thank you for that. You're Do welcome. you remember how you proposed? No. <laughs> <laughs> so how did he propose? Uh, he did get down on one knee. I did he get did. down on one knee. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Anyway. Can't do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to get up. Linda, in the, in the interview, obviously suggested that you were a bit of a naughty boy. <laughs> I was... I was naughty. I think naughty is the right word. I hadn't quite settled it, you know? Mm. And, and I was still in, the, in that realm of, well, my God, this woman's fantastic. Oh, she's nice. You know? <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was, that before, was that before or after you got married? Oh, no, it was before we got married. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, she, she can't talk, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. No, I always <laughs> say that. You've got a great relationship, yes. amazing marriage, five yeah. children, yeah. eight grandchildren yes. now, I think. What would you say to Linda right now? I love you. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> You got drunk with Michael Jackson? Oh, absolutely. Really? <laughs> You've had many showbiz pals over the years. One of your close friends was Michael Jackson. Yes. He used to call me up. He would say, you know, can you see, how can you mend a broken heart? Just sing a bit of it for me. Michael Jackson used to call yeah. you. I get you to sing... How yeah. you mend a broken heart down yeah. the phone? Yeah, and and, and... and what would you do? Sing it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to drink with him. Oh, yeah. We, we, um... Would you get... You got drunk with Michael Jackson? Oh, absolutely. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, um, whether... Uh, I think mainly Saki. Because we both love Saki and... Japanese and... wine? Yeah. You and he would get drunk on Japanese wine? Oh, what's wrong with that? <laughs> it's <laughs> just so weird and random. <laughs> what else would you do? Nothing. Uh, we sing, play music. Your son Ashley told us that Michael once accompanied you to see one of his school plays. Yes. Instead of mess Michael dressing down, he just went for it. You know, the shades and the braids. He gets out of the car, straightens himself up, and he goes, Where's your shades? I, goes, I can't wear shades. This is my kid's school. <laughs> <laughs> and so you sit at the back, you know, and watch everything. Kids on the stage are going, <laughs> They're not saying it, they're mouthing it, you know. And incredible. Yeah, incredible. You've had huge success as a performer and as a songwriter, and your brothers had been with you every step of the way. Well, the late 1970s, Barry and his brothers Robin and Morris were at the peak of their powers. The three of them had a very different sound, and when they sang together, the blend was unlike anything else. The love they had for one another, watching them on stage, you felt it. They were very much together, they laughed a lot. Then did you go to the mic and go... <laughs> Max's got some dynamite in his office. <laughs> <laughs> Dad and, and Robin are both very strong personalities and highly competitive. Morris really was kind of the uniter and kind of brought everybody together a lot. And it was time to bring another member of the Gibb family center stage. Ladies and gentlemen, our brother Andy! Twelve years Barry's junior, Andy had been too young to join the Bee Gees. But when he turned 19, he became a star in his own right, with three US number ones which Barry co-wrote and produced. He looked like Barry. He sounded like Barry. Dad and Andy were almost like twins, kind of like two peas in a pod. Just as Barry enjoyed success with all three of his brothers, he also began to work with artists outside the Gibb family. There was no one higher in demand from other artists. 
to write and produce than, than Barry Gibb. Islands in the Stream, sung by Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers, became one of the biggest selling country singles of all time. My dad, being such a huge country fan, I think is probably one of the things he's most proud of. But while Barry's songs ruled the charts, his brother Andy's life had unraveled. He'd spent years battling depression and cocaine addiction. I remember my grandfather George telling me, Andy's gone. And I said, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> he's gone. And he said, uh, he's dead. Only weeks after his 30th birthday, Andy had passed away from a heart infection, his body weakened by years of drug use. Everything changed for all of us when that happened because it was unfathomable. It was the first time I seen my dad cry was at Andy's funeral. I had never seen uh, pain and heartache like that. But I think that drove them back to, we gotta keep going, we gotta keep making music. The Bee Gees went on to write and record throughout the 1990s. By the turn of the millennium, the three brothers have been working together for more than 40 years. We're sort of doing an arrangement at the same time as we're going. Morris will very often come up with a chord we did not expect him to play. <laughs> In January 2003, Morris had emergency surgery on a blocked intestine. But just before the operation, he suffered a heart attack. I mean, he was living a very active and happy life. None of us saw it coming. He went in so quickly, and then, you know, the next thing you know, you know, he's in a coma. He died three days later at the age of 53. He missed Morris a lot. Morris was always like the man in the middle between him and Robin. The loss of Morris was the hardest blow to the family. Barry kind of sunk into what I call a black hole. And yeah, he didn't really want to do anything. And it was a sad time. An awful blow to you. You've had many blows, but Morris's death was just a, a devastating, shocking <clears throat> moment in time. Yeah. Well, it was so quick. I mean, I think that was, after losing Andy, that was, uh, that was crippling we, uh, emotionally for all of us, for the whole family. And uh, it, was, it wasn't something you could understand. You know, if someone can be there and, and gone in two days, you know. You didn't even really know he was sick. I mean, this no. just happened out of, out of the no. blue. I think he knew maybe for a few weeks that something was wrong. And, uh, and then it became very sudden. And, and uh, yeah, uh, what, what, can, what, what can you say? I mean, I can't really say anything that makes any sense. What kind of man was Morris? A great family man, very outgoing person, very um, loved kids, uh, loved magic, loved, loved being funny, a very funny man, very, uh, very outwardly humorous. You know, Robin was inwardly fum uh, humorous. Morris was outwardly. Morris was kind of the bridge between two brothers who were. Yeah, we know, were always not, not in exactly conflict. easy bedfellows. No. no, we were always in conflict. Robin was intensely creative, and and between the two of us, wanted the attention, wanted the attention, and if we didn't get it, we would compete for it. Uh, I think we loved each other deeply, but but I think we. Com competed all the way, competed all the way. Not with everyone else, not with other artists, with each other, yeah. Andy was 30 years old, I mean, yeah. just so young. We were forever changed. I don't think we were ever the same as three brothers because we'd lost Andy, especially at such a young age and such a beautiful person, mm. you know. He, Andy and I were very much alike mm. in that we loved the same things. Morris and Robin were twins, but not alike. And, and, and so they were closer to each other. Andy and I were close to each other. So we worked together a lot. The you father know. took the deaths of Andy and... Oh, broke, broke his heart. Yeah. yeah and and, and Mum. Uh, and I think that when you're youngest is always... That's always the toughest thing. Mm. And so uh, it, it, it broke their heart. Dad passed away a few years after that.
but really from a broken heart, mm. you know. Andy was his little light, you know. How did you find the strength to keep performing and recording with all these tragedies happening in your life? Because performing is the strength. Uh, that is the sort of, that, that's the fountainhead for me, is to be able to perform and see people light up at a certain song. And that's, that's it for me. I do everything in my life to please my family. I don't do it to please other people. That's the most important thing in life for me. When I'm on stage, my brothers, they're st still around me. It's always what would Robin think or what would Morris think. <laughs> Sitting opposite one of the most prolific and successful <laughs> songwriters over there. <laughs> Paul, back right. Hi, Paul. <laughs> uh, you came up with the explosions in the song Tragedy. Explain. Well, this was not a period where um, a technology was, you know, everything. You could, couldn't just make something happen. You went, had to go and create it. Well, we want to try and recreate the magic of your explosions. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> so we have got a we have got a mic, I think. I do that. <laughs> and we have got the track lined up. So Can't what we that. need from you, Barry Gibb, is some yes. explosions. That's fantastic. <laughs> Your mother, Barbara, uh, mm. very sadly passed away in August. Yes. Uh, she was 95 years old. She was a spiritual force. I mean, Mum was the one who didn't go to shows, but always got us ready to go to shows. She discovered us. Mm. That's what she said, you know. And, she, yeah, of course she did, you know. She said they wouldn't be here without me. <laughs> and I think that's true. Barry, after over half a century of making music, you're still very much at the top of your game. You don't know In 2009, Robin and Barry recorded a TV special. Babe, you don't know what it's like. It would be the last time they ever performed together. They had a deep, a deep love for each other, but they weren't talking so much. Okay. No, nobody sings like you, so it's we like... We should get together. We should get together. <laughs> we should have lunch. <laughs> The pair lived on different sides of the Atlantic, and Robin had news he was keeping from his brother. Dad, he'd seen a picture of Robin in, like, a British newspaper or something, and he said, he doesn't look well. He brought a picture of Uncle Robin to his doctor, and the doctor looked at him and said, you better go see your brother, he's, he's seriously ill. You better go now. He said he hasn't got long. But we, we never knew. Only then did Barry learn that Robin had been diagnosed with cancer. To see this, uh, this man just deteriorate before your eyes it was so sad. Dad went over there to say goodbye to him. He was laying in bed uh, and, uh, you know, barely able to speak. I hope Robin heard everything, you know, Dad was saying and, and, and went in peace and, you know, and knew how much his brother loved him. It was an incredible loss to him. Incredible. Robin's death meant that Barry was the last surviving brother. My dad felt like he needed to at least go do something. I said, well, you have got given talent. Um, get off your ass and make music. So Barry did get off his ass and went on tour. Just your jacket, Him getting back on the road was soothing for his soul. He needed to be lifted up again. It's everything to me. It's all I've ever known. I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> I can't get a job. <laughs> and let me live, love me. The tour was a family affair, with Morris's daughter Sam on vocals and Barry's son Stephen on guitar. This was an incredible experience for me standing next to him. Barry had his mojo back and began writing his first new album for 15 years, collaborating with Stephen and his second son, Ashley. A minor and then B. Writing with them 
was like writing with his brothers. And I can hear them laughing in the other room. And that makes me feel good. The album, In The Now, won rave reviews and gave Barry a number two chart hit at the age of 70. The voice sounds as good as ever. There appears to be no waning of his powers. I think he's just going to keep on going for as long as he possibly can, you know? It's just amazing that he goes on and on and on. And don't forget, he's a real dad and he's a real grandpa. Papa is incredible at what he does. He's amazing. He's awesome. We like to be silly together. We'll like, we'll look at each other just sometimes and we'll just make like a crazy face. We're very proud of you. We love you. We couldn't ask for a better father. The best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, it's been a wonderful life. Love you. We love, love you, Papa. Papa. Love you, Papa. <laughs> It doesn't get better than that, does no. it? No. If your grandchildren said, you know what, we're going to form a band, we're going to go into the yeah. world of pop, how would you feel? Would you, feel would you want them to? Yeah, I, I, I think you should follow your bliss. I think you should follow that thing inside you that says, this is what you must do with your life. Go for it, believe it. But believe it. Don't half believe it, because that won't work. After Robin died, when you look at all the iconic video images of the Bee Gees, yeah. there are the three of you around a microphone. Yeah. And you said that you could almost feel each other's breath on each other's necks. You were that close. Yes. Um, you could tell what we'd all eaten. You could tell what we'd all drank. You could, you could, everything about that human essence was there around one, one microphone. And, and the sharing of the songs, sharing of the performances, knowing when it was really good and it really worked, and it, in a way, it was profound what we were doing. I'm always reliving it, always reliving it. When I'm on stage, they're st still around me. I'm never without them. And it's always what would Robin think or what would Morris think. Or, um, they're just there. Mm. And Andy. It never goes away. It never goes away. How would you like to be remembered? It's one of the Bee Gees. That's, that's, that's it for me. I, you know, I've always... I'm still playing second fiddle, and, 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 and I enjoy playing second fiddle. What do you mean by that? Um, that I can never be the brand name the Bee Gees were. I can never really... Um, I can never really make that all happen again, you know? Um, so I reflect on it. I, st I love writing songs. I still love doing what I'm doing. But, uh, you know, I, it, it, I've realised that everything stops at some point, no matter who you are, no matter how famous you think you get, you're never aware of it, and it ends at some point. What's been for you the moment that, when you look back at your career, if you could relive it again right now, which one would you, would you choose? Um, the day we met, the day I met Linda. The day I met Linda is the greatest spiritual moment of my life. And to know that I didn't have to search anymore, that here she was, you know? There's always, you know, other women and there's always other guys. But this was, this was an absolute certainty. And, and I stopped searching. If you thought to yourself, right, of all the songs I've ever written, I'm oh, going to sing one of them, which song would you choose? Uh, to Love Somebody. To Love Somebody. Because it's always been a joy to do, a clear emotional message. When you sing it now, who do you think about? <laughs> <laughs> There's only one person I would think about, yeah, you know. Well, Barry, it's been, it's been a remarkable experience to go through your extraordinary life. Thank you. To love somebody might be a perfect way to oh. finish the interview. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can do it. I don't know some of it anyway. OK. There's a way Everybody say to do each and every little thing But what good does it bring If I ain't got you Ain't got you And you don't know what it 
To love somebody, to love somebody, the way I love.